I was over there last week. And yeah. Well, guys, I'll see you later. I gotta get back to work. So. Okay. Yeah, I guess I do too. I'll see you later. Hey, could you wait around a minute? I got a couple questions I'd like to ask you. Yeah, I guess. What's uh, what's on your mind? Have you ever heard of a herbicide called Rascal? But my understanding is you gotta be careful with it. Well, I know you do it. I'd really like to use it because I know it'll be just the ticket for my problems. But I can't afford a screw up on this one, and it, the ones I've used in the past have been awful forgiving. <laughs> You mean you've been using herbicides all this time? You've been screwing up all this time? No, I haven't been screwing up. I've gotten by with a few minor problems, nothing I couldn't live with. But, well, using Rascal, it bothers me. Well, I guess, what do you want from me? Well, you seem to understand spray equipment awful well, and, and you don't even seem to have many problems. I'd just like to pick your brain for a few minutes if I could. Well, sure. Um, uh, I don't have anything pressing right now to do. Uh, well, where do you want to start? One of the things the Rascal label said when I was looking at it, it says I need to put on 20 gallons an acre. And I remember my spray is only putting on 12 gallons an acre. I don't know where to go from here. Okay, we need to start at square one and answer some basic questions, I guess. Now, the, the label requires 20 gallons. It's really important. That's probably the minimum requirement. So you need to apply at least 20 gallons. So we'll have to make sure how your sprayer is set up. I guess the second question is what kind of speed you can use for the conditions where you're going to apply this material, you know. Well, I'm set up to go at five miles an hour. Well, third then would be what pressure do you want to operate this in? I don't know. Well, I guess my next question to you then would be which is more important to you, drift or coverage? Both. Well, that's true. Keep in mind that if we're going to operate at higher pressures and smaller droplets, it's better coverage, but the drift potential is much greater than if you go to lower pressure and larger droplets, the drift potential is greatly reduced. So there's a big section I read in the label on drift, and I remember Roy Johnson got into a lawsuit last year because of drift with Rascal. I can't afford that. Besides, a little bit of Rascal is going to go an awful long ways. All right, well, then we better select a tip or a nozzle size, then, that will produce larger droplets and then run at lower pressure. Well, basically, I think we've got all the information we need to go over to the chem supply and see Doug and get the right tips uh, for this job. Well, I don't know why I need new tips or nozzles. They work fine. <laughs> what size are they? Same size everybody else is using. Oh, what kind are they? Or flat fan nozzle. Ah, come on. Let's go over. We'll get the right nozzles for the right job. Oh, I go down here. Uh, yeah, leave some money for the girl, will you? Hi, Daryl. Hi, John. What can I do for you today? Hi, Doug. Hi, Doug. John's got a problem setting up for a rascal application. John said that you set up your sprayer last go around. You might have some answers we could use. Oh, man, that was a couple years ago. I'm going to guess he had WR2 nozzles, probably 40 PSI, and most of the guys around here would be going about five miles an hour. Well, would you use the same setup for Rascal? Hmm, I'd hate to guess at that till I uh, looked at the label. Yeah, but, but wait a minute, Doug. I was talking to Roy Johnson. He said he had some drift problems using Rascal. How, do you remember how he was set up? Oh, I think the safest way to handle that, John, would be to uh, look at the nozzle booklet and, and read the label, and that'd give us the best idea what to okay. do. Okay, why don't we do that? Let's see. Spray nozzle book's right here. Uh, I think about this page. And Rascal's new enough that we keep the label right handy. It does have quite a drift warning on it. Uh, the best way to handle that is to go to the largest droplet size as possible. Uh, there's always a chance of some susceptible plants nearby. And then the label also states that we have to have 20 gallons of water per acre. Let's look at the nozzle booklet, John, and see what would be best. You are going to apply that by broadcast treatment, aren't you? Right. I'm going to use a ground rig, but really what difference is that going to make, Doug? Well, let's look at the difference in the spray patterns and relative droplet size of these nozzles. 
Well, it looks here like I should probably use a WR fan tip because it says right there that it will uh, provide medium-sized droplets with good coverage and less drift. Right, now we need to determine the right nozzle tip size. Your tips are spaced to 20 inches, aren't they? I think so, Doug. How fast do you want to go? About five miles an hour. Okay, we're here in the book. What we have in this column is a list of the GPAs or gallons per acre and 20 inch nozzle spacing and about five miles per hour, right? Okay, I can still follow you there. Okay, let's look down through here and find something close to 20 gallons per acre. What pressure does this first one correspond with? Boy, Doug, that shows 60 PSI. That's pretty high. Aren't I going to get a lot of drift with that? Yeah, probably so. Uh, here's one at 30 PSI, but the speed needs to be slowed down to 4 and not 5 miles per hour. Well, I don't mind slowing down a little bit, but uh, what size nozzle tip will that take? Uh, according to the book, we need a WR3, and it requires a 50 mesh screen. Now, what's this 50 mesh screen stuff? Oh, come on, John. Screens are the stuff that keeps your nozzles from getting plugged. The larger the nozzle orifice, the larger the screen size. The booklet always tells which one of the screens you need to use with what tip. Which type of tips can I get for you guys? The aluminum and the brass ones uh, tend to wear out a little bit faster if you have the uh, wettable powders. However, they are quite inexpensive. Another choice would be the uh, nylon or the stainless steel tips. They last a long time, uh, especially with the wettable powders. And would have a little bit of trouble probably with the uh, nylon tips when we're working with the solvents. Another choice would be the ceramics, but when you start working with ceramics, you gotta look like a bunch of money involved there. Well, I think a stainless steel tips would be great for this selection, uh, John, for Rascal. Well, Doug, I'll, I'll go with the stainless steel tips. So, and for my setup, I'll need, you better just give me 20 stainless steel tips with some uh, screens. Okay, I'll go get them for you, and uh, then I'll put them in your account. Just a minute. Okay, Doug, thanks a lot. Here are the tips, guys, and uh, the one free thing you're going to get out of us this year is your toothbrush, and I want you to keep your screen clean with that, John. Thanks a lot, Doug. Appreciate it. Well, thanks for coming in, guys. Appreciate doing business with you. Thanks a lot for the help, Doug. We appreciate it. I'll make sure he keeps those screens clean for you. Okay, Daryl. Make sure he does. We'll see you later. See you, Thank Doug. You. So, John, this is that little puppy sprayer, huh? Most of these uh, field sprayers, you know, do have some troubles. We better check this one over good before we use it. Well, this has been a good sprayer, Daryl, but the last I used it was last fall. Okay. This tank looks pretty good condition on the outside, and it's, uh, well, it's clean, too. It really looks good. Thanks. I'm pretty good about rinsing and cleaning it, especially with a lot of the different herbicides that I use. Okay, John, start her up. Well, the agitation looks like it's running all right, John. Go ahead and shut it off. When was the last time you checked this mainline filter? Well, it's been quite a while. We better do it. All right, I'm not getting out of there without my gloves. I'd say it's been quite a while. This thing's really dirty, John. What do you want me to do, just get a new one? Nah, let's just take it up to the shop and you can clean it and we'll put it back on. Okay. Hey, where'd you go, California? It would have been a lot more fun. Is this clean enough now? Yeah, it looks like we are. Right. Looks like we'll do the job. You put it back on? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, John, start her up and set the pressure for about 30 pounds. Look at this for a second. Yeah, 
Yeah, John, if you've got a wee bit of a problem here, if this is the way it looked last time, it's really bad. Look at that nozzle there by you. Yeah, go ahead and mark it, and then we'll move on to the next one. Now, that next one and the next one, too, it look all right, but look at that one there. It's just not putting out as much. Next few look okay. Go on down to the right boom there, and you'll see, uh, yeah, right there, that one's got a fouled up pattern. Rest of them look okay, John. Why don't you go around and turn it off? Let's see what's the matter with these. This is the first one. I wasn't putting anything out. Okay, Daryl. What? There's no screen in it, John. Is there supposed to be? Yes, there's supposed to be. It plugged his tire in a drum. Oh. We'll that's what a, was wrong with it. Too. Yes, here. Okay. We'll put a screen in that one, fix it, and go get the next one. Okay. Now, I remember the pattern was a little phony on this. It looked like it just wasn't putting out enough. Yeah, I remember. Well, got, you got, got a screen in that one. I see that. There's anything up in it. I don't feel anything. Da. You got the wrong size nozzle. That's oh, a really? one. Oh. Not a three. Oh. That make a difference? Yes. Let's get the next one. Now this is the one, remember, that was heavy to one side and the pattern was uneven on it? Yeah. So. Well. Got a screen. Let's see what this one looks like, John. Well, it's the same way. Like I said, Daryl, they're, they're both the same kind of nozzles. I can't tell any difference. Are the tips the same size? Yeah, same size tips. Well, now how am I going to show you this? What are you talking about? The difference in the size of the orifice inside. One's wore out. Which would you say was the newer of these two? Look at the one on the left, Daryl. It does look well used, even a little bit abused. I think you're right about that. As a general rule of thumb, you know, if a nozzle's worn more than 10%, it should be replaced. That's what the manufacturer says. And you need to replace them on a regular, every year basis. Well, the nozzle output's in the booklet, right? Right, John. Well, we've got these nozzles scored away. Let's go on to something else. Now, we just went through all this. What did what'd you learn? I learned about three things. Number one, the screens. You got to have them in there in the first place, and you got to make sure that they're not plugged up. Okay. Secondly, on the nozzles, the biggest thing I learned, I think, is you got to have the same types of nozzles on a boom. Okay. And the last thing, looking at these nozzles you pointed out, is you got to make sure that they're not worn because they'll give you an uneven pattern. All right. You got them. Those are the three things. Tell you what, why don't you go ahead and fire this puppy up? I thought I saw a leak down there on a boom a minute ago. Okay. Okay, John, let's fire this puppy up and see if we can't see what's wrong with these leaks we think we've got down here. I think it's a clamp myself. Okay, you ready, Daryl? Yeah, go ahead. And clear. There we go. Hold it. Hold it. Let me see that gauge. How high was that? It said only 60 pounds. Well, this has got to stop. I don't mind helping you, but we got to fix this stuff. Let me look at that thing. I'm sure that was only 60 now. That's all it showed, Daryl. Well, that you did tell that old piece of been on there forever. This has got to stop. Why don't you go down to Doug's and see if you can't find a new gauge, and I'm going to go change my clothes. You can do it now? Yes. <laughs> Sorry about the wet down, Daryl. Oh, that's, that's never happened before. Yeah, I went to see right. Doug. He gave me the best gauge he had. Well, it looks like a good one. It's big enough. Well, put it on. Maybe this won't happen again. I'll give it a shot. Stand back, Daryl. I'll start it up again. Okay, John. Sixty psi now. Does everything look okay back there? Yeah, the hoses aren't leaking. Let's go ahead and crank it on down to 30 pounds and align some of these tips. They're bad.
Turn it off and come around here and take a look. What do you mean alignment? Well, John, the, the nozzles are designed to offset themselves about 15 degrees so they spray past each other, not into each other. And there's several of those that are wrong. You might want to just take a wrench and straighten them back out where they belong. So they're about 15 degree offset on each one. Oh, I see. Well, that would be easy enough to fix. Sure. All right, we better check this boom height. Why are you going to do that? It looked fine to me. Well, if it's not at the proper height and not level, we're going to get an uneven and distorted pattern on the ground. So when it booms too high, you get excessive overlap. And if it's too low, you don't get any overlap. You actually get skips in your pattern. When a boom's not level, the pattern's distorted. So you get highs and lows within the pattern itself. It's got to be level and at the proper height. Well, John, let's see what the book says. Well, for 20 inch spacing on the nozzles, we should be 17 to 19 above the ground. Well, Darrell, it's not much of a job to lower the boom. Why don't we just do it now? Yeah, let's do it. It's got it, Daryl. They're all at the right height. Good. Well, John, do you think this gauge is any good? Well, it should be, Daryl, for as much as I paid for it. Well, I don't know. You never know with these new. I'll tell you what. The book says WR3 nozzles at 30 pounds. We should catch, out of one nozzle out there to check this gauge, 33 ounces in one minute. I think we should do that. That'll check the gauge. Let's go do it. John, come on around. We'll collect this. Here's a graduated container and a stopwatch. Collect it for 15 seconds on one nozzle, and then we'll check it against the block, and that way we can check the gauge like we said we would. Okay, Daryl. John, what'd you get? Just a little bit over eight ounces, Daryl. Well, good. I brought this book in, just so we'd know. And one nozzle, now you've got for 15 seconds? Right. Okay. Well, look at that. If you figure a little over eight ounces, in a minute, that'd come right about 33 ounces. That means the gauge is right on. Got your money's worth. Well, that does it, right, Daryl? Wrong. What do you mean, wrong? Well, now, what have you done? Well, we put new nozzles on. Okay. We aligned them. Okay. We lowered the boom and leveled it. All right. We put a brand new pressure gauge on. What else is there? Well, you're almost up to speed, but what about speed? We mean speed. Well, the speed you're going to drive this tractor at. I think the book will have to look, but I think the book says four to five mile an hour to get 20 gallons to acre. Oh. Five. No, I'm supposed to be going, what, four miles an hour, right? Right, Carol? right. Okay, well, if you give me a few minutes, I'll check out this tractor with the sprayer on it and check the speeds I need to be going to go four mile an hour. All right, I'll tell you what. Lots of times these tacks and, and RPM indicators are not correct. I'll go over and lay out a 200-foot course for you, measure it out, and then you can drive across it, and we'll time it, and we'll know exactly how fast you're going. Well, you made it this far. I did, Daryl. Figured out second range, third gear, about 2,400 RPM will get me four miles an hour. All right, here's the timer, or the stopwatch. We've laid the course out from flag to flag. You need to go both ways. Tell me what the time is each way, and you need a running start, so you're up to speed when you get to the first flag. All right. Let's do her.
How'd you do? Good. I got 29 seconds the first trip, and I got 31 seconds coming back. Ah, uh, John, that's a uh, 30-second average. That's four and a half mile an hour. That's close enough, isn't it? No, no, no. Remember when we went over the label? It said you had to have a minimum of 20 gallons right. to the acre. Right. Well, you're going faster than you should. Now, what's that do to you? Well, I'm putting on just a little bit less. Well, just a little bit. Let me show you something. Look here. You need to be right at four mile an hour. And that 34 seconds, look what it does to you over here in the nozzle table. I can understand most of the table. I understand the WR3 type of a tip at 30 PSI. But boy, when I get to the gallons per acre, it's confusing me. All right, John. Look at the table. The table says that at four miles an hour, you're 21.2 gallons per acre. Right. Okay, now look at the top of the chart again and come down. At five mile an hour, you're 15.6 gallons per acre. Right. Okay. Now you told me, and we figured out, you were traveling four and a half miles an hour. Right. Well, that's only 18.4 gallons per acre. That's, that's the average between those two figures. Which is under the label. That's correct. Okay. Now you're gonna have to be at four mile an hour to meet the requirements of the label the 20 gallons per acre. Okay. All right. Now, what happens if you speed up? Well, if you speed up like shows here, I'm going to be putting on even less than I was putting on. That's correct. If you slow down to four mile an hour where you should be? Then as I slow down, I will gradually put on more. That's correct. But at four mile an hour, you're going to have the right amount, aren't you? Right. Okay. I'm going to give her another shot. I'll crank back a little on the RPMs and should get it right this time. Okay, John. Have at. <laughs> How'd you do? 33 up, 35 back, 34 average. Daryl, we got her just right this time. Hey, good. Be sure and mark those speeds, both the tack and the gears, because you're going to need it for all the rest of the time you're using this. Is there anything else? No, I think we got this puppy done. Great. It's got WR3 nozzles in it. We set the pressure at 30 pounds, we know that. You're driving four miles an hour and you're putting out 21.2 gallons by the book now. That meets the label requirements. You should have very little drift potential with this, but always keep in mind now, anytime you do it, that any changes in speed or pressure or nozzles are going to alter the output of this sprayer. And you should monitor all this stuff on a regular basis all the time. You won't have this trouble anymore. Well, thanks a lot, Darrell. That's great. I owe you a big one for this. You bet you owe me a big dinner. Ready to go? Yeah, go ahead. Your nozzles are... I can't <laughs> say that. First round one. First round one. Outtake, outtake. Some other basic things that have to be answered is, um, is, I don't know what... John, do you think this new gauge is good? Well, it should be as much as dog, uh, dog and cats uh, jumped to my bone. <laughs> okay. Who are you looking at? Who are you talking to? I'm talking to Daryl. Oh. No, I'm talking to John. John. Yeah. Okay. okay, I'm talking to John. <clears throat> I need to find new nozzles. It's like, well, what, what kind do you have? Yeah. Well, I got a flat panel. Well, what size? Yeah. Same size as everybody else around here. Well, let's go and find out what they are. And then yeah, get up. Okay. All right. Well, I think we've got all the basic information. <laughs> Could charge me for it, aren't you? Huh? Between these two tips, John, this one's plumb worn out. Which one did you say was the newer of the two? Well, look at the one on the left, Daryl. It does look well used. Even looks a little bit abused. What pressure does this first one correspond with? Boy, that shows 60 PSI. That's pretty high pressure. We're going to get a lot of drift with that, aren't we, Doug? Hey, you want this thing aimed at him? Oh, I was going to sit here and give you a little play-by-play. -play. <laughs> Make sure that the tips right aren't worn. OK, I can do it. One, two, three. OK, okay. okay. all right. Car coming. Oh. Okay, I think. Well, Daryl, I'm sure glad we went through that 
blessed routine, especially since we were going to change the nozzles anyway. <laughs> How did you learn a couple things, John? Anytime you do it, that any changes in speed or pressure or nozzles are going to alter the output of this sprayer. And you should monitor all this stuff on a regular basis all the time. You won't have this trouble anymore. Hi, I'm Gary Thomas. And I'm Carol Ramsey. We're here to discuss some of the problems that you're likely to face when dealing with pesticide label use instructions. Specifically, we'll focus on the part of the label that deals with the product application rate. Because there are so many different types of products and different uses, there are many different application rates listed on pesticide labels. Look at the application rate instructions on this label. These types of use directions are normally found on home use products. Essentially, home use products are built to where anybody should be able to use them properly. Got that right. Even Gary shouldn't be able to mess up with this type of product. <laughs> Actually, however, you're not going to run into pesticide label instructions that are this simple to follow. In fact, I think we ought to bag this simple stuff and get to the meat of the subject. Okay. Actually, as a licensed pesticide applicator, you are more likely to see instructions like this label. In this case, this material controls dollar spot, a plant disease. If you apply one ounce of the product per thousand square feet. Hey Gary, look at this one. For control of apple aphid or apple maggot, you'll need to use a rate of Lohr's band at three pounds per acre. Ah, here's one with a combination of application rates. If you wanted to control black medic, you would apply one pint of this product per acre or 0.37 fluid ounces per thousand square feet or two and a half teaspoons per thousand square feet. But look here, to control drift it says that you need to apply no less than 20 gallons of spray per acre. Did you notice the one thing that all three of these labels had in common? Each of the labels in question dictate how much of the product is to be applied to a specific size area. This product label dictates that a certain amount of the product be applied per thousand square feet. Whereas with this product, the label dictates that you apply a certain amount of product per acre. And with this product, the label says to apply a certain amount of the product either per thousand square feet or per acre. You know, Gary, the problem is, is that people don't deal with a thousand square feet or acre measures. And those areas are the areas that are commonly listed on the label in the application rate. Well, you have a point. Maybe we should take these good people out and show them what these areas amount to. OK? These markings show the boundary of a thousand square feet. Remember the confront label said that we were to apply this very small amount of material to the area that you see here, a thousand square feet. An acre is approximately the same size as a football field if we were to measure the football field from goal line to goal line 
and sideline to sideline. Again, the confront label instructs us to apply this small amount of material to a relatively large area. And that's what you're going to encounter when making most pesticide applications. Well, as should be obvious, we spare no expense in demonstrating the principles of pesticide application. Here we are, made a quick trip to Paris. We are positioned in front of the Louvre in an appropriate place to do a little painting. Gay, gay Paris. Gay Paris, even. Now, what we're going to ask Carol to do is to work with a relatively small amount of paint to apply this evenly over this nine square foot board. Think you can handle it? Always. Good. Let's get at it. Okay, you do it your way, and I'll do it my way. Okay. And we'll see which one turns out best. I'm gonna get a bigger brush this time. Good idea. Hey, what's, what's taking you so long, Thomason? Hey, I'm reminded of an old story about a turtle and a bunny. <laughs> get to bar time if you don't get on with it. Four ounces. Hey, you forgot the paint. Nay, mind your own business. I have one ounce left. This means it took me three ounces to cover this board with water and create a masterpiece in the process. Well, that's wonderful, but where's the paint enter your masterpiece? Well, the paint's coming, Carol. Understand that the important thing is I know exactly how much liquid it took to cover this board. Nine square feet, three ounces, took the cover. Now all I have to do is to mix that paint with water so that I fill it up to a total of three ounces, and then I'll know I'll cover this board very nicely and evenly with that three ounces of paint and water. <laughs> you probably didn't have any left over either, did you? And I probably won't have any left over, no. That's the beauty of this system. I can't believe I'm going to say this, but your method was a little bit better than mine. Just a little bit better than mine. You 
covered your board with water and then mixed the paint and brought up just that amount of solution. So now this is all it is going to take to cover your board versus my board. Yep. Let's face it. You've just witnessed the application of a smidgen of intelligence and a dollop of ingenuity. Well, I know what this will co cover a little bit better. Uh -huh. Remember, folks, you saw it here. We just demonstrated how you take a relatively small amount of material and mix it with just enough water to evenly cover a specific area. That's what this stupid board demonstration was supposed to point out to you. But you probably wonder, what's this really got to do with pesticide applications? Well, I suppose you think we're even now. A little closer. <laughs> well, I want to emphasize one thing. The principles are the same, whether they be for paint or pesticides. If a pesticide label directs you to apply a relatively small amount of pesticide over a large area, then you should approach this problem the same way I did with the paint. It's that simple. That's all we've tried to emphasize with this segment of the video. You know, there's a couple things that one has to go through in order to apply pesticides according to label instructions. Well, that's the key. You've got to read the label directions. You've got to find the use directions and determine what the application rate is for the job that you're going to carry out. Well, this label says that for the preventative rate, we're going to apply it one ounce of product per thousand square feet. Other labels may use units such as 10 square feet, 100 square feet, some even say an acre. Since Bailaton 25 is to be applied per thousand square feet, we must determine how much water it takes our application equipment to cover that size area. I'm going to repeat that. Is anybody home in there? Are you listening to me? We've got to find out how much water it takes our application equipment to cover the unit area listed in the label application rate direction. That's what calibration is all about. And that's what this video is about. Calibration is just like the paint exercise we went through just a minute ago. All it is is simply figuring out your sprayer's delivery rate. Sometimes this may require the change or adjustment of your sprayer to meet label requirements. Calibrating a sprayer is really no different than what I did with the paintbrush. Remember, I determined how much water the paintbrush delivered to the nine square foot board. Since most spray mixes consist of more than 90% water, we can just calibrate using water alone. Well, what do you say we calibrate a backpack sprayer for the use of this material so we can demonstrate the process to these people? Okay, why don't I go grab some of the equipment? Great. Remember that the label on this particular pesticide requires that we apply one ounce per thousand square feet. So what we're going to have to do is measure out a thousand square feet. Carol, yeah. would you pick up the tape measure and the flagging material so we can measure out a thousand square feet? Yeah, I'll tell you, let's measure out an area that's uh, say 40 by 25. That's a thousand square feet. Yeah, okay. All right. <laughs> thousand square feet. First we've had Carol fill the sprayer and I'm going to mark the level of water in the sprayer. Well I think I'm ready. Okay, go for it. In order for Gary to do this properly, he's going to have to maintain a constant pace and keep the pressure equal throughout the entire application. For a guy who has problem walking and chewing gum at the same time, this could be interesting. 
Uh, your pump is going a little slow. <laughs> are you keeping your pace pretty even, or are you slowing down and speeding up? God, you're a nag. Here's a 64 ounces you can start with. Can you just pour that without spilling? All right. Give it a try. I'm going to need some more. That does it, and I've got nine ounces left. You gave me 64 in this one, so nine from 64 is 55 ounces, plus 64. It's 119. 119 ounces. Per? Per 1,000 square feet. That's what it's all about. That's the calibrated sprayer delivery rate for this sprayer. The way I did it. That delivery rate is only valid for the speed, pressure, and nozzle height that I maintained while I was making this application. If Carol went out and made the application, her delivery rate would be somewhat different, mainly because she walks funny, she would have a different speed, she'd probably maintain a different pressure and hold the nozzle at a different height. Her delivery rate would be different, no doubt. And we just went through the exercise of calibrating on the spray the area method. Why don't we grab a piece of golf course spray application equipment and calibrate it using a different method? Good idea. Here's an example of one of the many calibration methods based on a mathematical formula. Each of the formula type calibration methods requires accurate measurement of delivery rate factors and the ability to do some basic math. Gary, why don't we calibrate the sprayer for a confront application, and we need to pay attention to what the label instructions are, so what's a common application for a golf course? When working with this product, and if we're trying to control common dandelion, the label dictates that we apply one and a half to two pints of the product per acre, but the label also states that in order to reduce the potential for drift, we're going to have to apply this material in at least 20 gallons of water per acre. So what unit area do you think we're going to have to base this equipment calibration on? Well, I really hope that the audience came up with the answer on an acre basis. Well, let's get rolling. OK. A common method used to calibrate sprayers with auxiliary engine or PTO-driven pumps is one in which speed, nozzle output and nozzle spacing are measured. We'll calibrate this sprayer using a method based on a mathematical formula. If we accurately measure nozzle output in ounces per second, sprayer speed in feet per second, and nozzle spacing in inches, we can plug the measurements into this formula and the gallon per acre delivery rate of the sprayer can be calculated. 4084 is a mathematical constant. It's used to convert the feet, inch, and ounce measurements to a gallon and acre measures. The first step in this calibration technique is to determine the nozzle output in ounces per second. I've set the pressure at 30 PSI. This is the operating pressure I've chosen to make this application. Gary is collecting the output from several nozzles to get a reasonable sample of nozzle output and to check the uniformity as well. I collected nozzle output for 15 seconds from each of four different nozzles, and these are the results. When we add these outputs together and divide by the number of nozzles, I get an average output of 16.75 ounces per 15 seconds. Then. We divide the average ounces collected by 15 seconds and get 1.12 ounces per second. The ounce per second delivery rate factor is 1.12. Now we've accounted for the first variable in this formula. 
Next, we have to measure the true speed of the spray rig in feet per second. To do this, I'm measuring and marking a 200-foot course in the area to be sprayed. Prior to making a speed check, I selected an operating speed appropriate for the terrain and the equipment. I also recorded the gear and throttle settings for future reference. With a running start at the selected gear and throttle settings, Gary times the sprayer across the 200-foot course and records the time it takes to cover that 200 feet. He repeats this procedure going the opposite direction. The first pass took 27 seconds. The second pass, 29 seconds. So the average time over the 200-foot course is 28 seconds. If we divide 200 feet by 28 seconds, the sprayer speed is 7.14 feet per second. That accounts for the second variable in the formula. To determine nozzle spacing, measure the distance between any two adjacent nozzles. Be sure to measure from center to center and record the number in inches. The nozzle spacing is 20 inches. Hey folks, we measured these variables. We've inserted them into the formula. And now, finally, we can calculate the sprayer delivery rate. This is the sprayer delivery rate in gallons per acre. It meets the label requirement of a minimum of 20 gallons per acre. If more or less material needs to be applied, simply adjust the sprayer and recalibrate it until the desired delivery rate is achieved. Well, I'm impressed now. You did good work. All we have to do now is go back to the office and finish it off. We've calibrated the sprayer. Let's go back and finish out the amount of product we're going to need for the job and the amount of spray mix we're going to need for the job. Sounds good. I'll drink the coffee. You do the math. That's fair enough, isn't it? Yeah, right. This way. <laughs> she said this way. <laughs> Before we can finish this, we really need two things. We're going to need the product label so we know how much product we're supposed to be applying, and we need a map so we know how much area we're going to be covering. So if you grab the product label, I'll grab the map and we'll get started. Where, where did you put it? Here it is. You golf, don't you? golf, don't you? If you use the term loosely, yes. <laughs> I manage to get out and make a fool of myself two or three times a year. If that's called golfing, that's what I do. Well, that's what golfing is, isn't it? <laughs> Press duffers. Seriously, if, if you were a superintendent on a golf course and you were trying to make an application, how much could you get accomplished in a day before the golfer showed up? Well, if you had the spray rig all ready to go at daybreak, you'd probably get at least two fairways done on the front nine and possibly three or four fairways on the back nine before the golfers arrive. Okay, here's a map of the golf course. Let's just treat the first and the second fairways. So each is 5.7 acres, so we'll be treating a total of 11.4 acres. That sounds reasonable. But first, we'd better record how the equipment was set up and what the calibrated delivery rate was for the sprayer. We calibrated the sprayer and it delivered 32 gallons per acre. The sprayer had 8006 nozzles on it and we operated at a pressure of 30 psi. Tractor was in second gear and operating at 2200 rpm. That tank had a capacity of 200 gallons, didn't it? Yeah, 200 gallons. Since we know the delivery rate is 32 gallons per acre, we can then determine the amount of product that we're going to need for the job and the amount of water we're going to need for the job. Okay, uh, where do you want to start? Well, let's find out how much product it's going to take to cover the 11.4 acres. Grab the label and find out what the rate is for dandelion and lamb's court. Well, here we have common dandelion, and here we have lamb's quarters. For both of them, it says one and a half to two pints per acre. 
Let's go with a two pint per acre rate. Okay. If we've got 11.4 acres to treat and we're applying two pints per acre, that means to treat the entire two fairways, we're going to need 22.8 pints of product. Uh, two pints per acre times 11.4 acres equals 22.8 pints. So far, so good. There are eight pints in a gallon, so 22.8 pints divided by eight is 2.8 gallons of product. Okay, so for how much water we're going to need, if we're applying 32 gallons to the acre, and we've got 11.4 acres to treat. This ought to be good. 365 gallons of spray for the job. Okay. Spray puts out 32 gallons per acre times 11.4 acres. That equals 364.8. I'll give you the two tenths of a gallon. We'll round it to 365 gallons. But your tank only holds 200 gallons. Lots of pits. But what we can do is just make up two back batches. If our tank holds 200 and we need 365 gallons, we'll do one tank at 200 gallons and another tank at 165 gallons. That'll make 365 gallons. It'll do the job. Should be okay. Yeah, okay. But you need to calculate the area that these two loads will cover so we can determine how much of the product is going to be needed for each batch. Well, that's easy. If you need to determine how much area a spray batch will cover, you simply take the amount of spray and you divide it by the sprayer delivery rate, the GPA. So if we've got a 200 gallon spray batch and we divide it by 32 gallons per acre, it gives us six and a quarter acres is what that 200 gallons will cover. Well, I'll write it down, but I'm going to double check it too. 200 gallons divided by 32 gallons per acre I punch that up and it's yep, it's equal to six and a quarter acres. Okay, for the second batch, we've got 165 gallons of spray. So if we divide 165 gallons by the 32 gallon per acre sprayer delivery rate, it gives us five acres that it covers. All right, I'm going to divide the 165 gallons by the 32 gallons per acre delivery rate and I get, when I punch this up, I get 5.15 acres. You missed that one, lady. Well, not by much. Let's figure out how much product we're going to need for each one of these batches. The 200-gallon batch covers 6.25 acres. And if we're applying two pints per acre, and we've got to cover 6.25 acres, we're going to need 12 and a half pints of product for the 200 gallons of spray. All right. 6.25 acres times two pints for each of those acre acres equals, I get 12.5 pints too. Okay. For the 165 gallon batch, there was 5.15 acres. And at a rate of two pints per acre, we will need 10.3 pints of product. 5.15 acres times the two pints for each of those acres. And I get 10.3 pints as well. Pretty good. Well, I think that pretty much wraps us up. We've uh, gone and we've calibrated the sprayer. We got the 32 gallons per acre, and then once we had that figure, we were able to determine the amount of product and the amount of spray that we needed for the job. So where we're at now is we can go out and fill up our sprayer tomorrow morning, if we so chose, and make the application to those two fairways. And the basis for that was that we calibrated the sprayer. But what I want to ask you is, do you think 
that we got these points across to these people on why calibration is so important. I hope that these people are aware of the importance of calibration and how many of the pesticide labels that they will be working with will require that the equipment that they work with be calibrated. And they're going to have to take the time to do that calibration properly as best they can. The reason we're trying to do calibration is because we're trying to achieve good pest control. And in order to achieve good pest control, you've got to be applying pesticides at the rate listed on pesticide labels. And with most of the products that you're going to be using that will require that product be applied to a specific area at a specific dosage. And in order to achieve that proper rate of application, it's imperative that you calibrate your sprayer so you know exactly how much spray is going out per that area that you're wanting to apply to. And only once you know how much spray is coming out of that sprayer can you mix the proper amount of product to where on each portion of the area that you'll be applying, it will be getting that two pounds per acre rate or the 10 pound per acre rate or the two ounces per thousand square feet area. That's what you're trying to achieve with application, is getting that product applied at the proper rate on your site. Now this particular presentation hasn't devoted a lot of time to the different kinds of calibration methods that are available. And one thing that we should emphasize to you is that there is no way that you're going to learn how to calibrate unless you go out one-on-one -on -one with the spray application equipment that you're going to be working with. Go out and work with it. Use the proper publications that will tell you in a step-by-step -step way how to calibrate the equipment. Go out and do it. Only by doing it are you ever going to learn how this process really works. But it's important also that you know what that calibration is to be used for. Really, you can't comply with any of the pesticide labels unless you have calibrated. But you've got to continue with your calculations in determining how much pesticide and how much water you're going to make up in each tank batch. It's work, and you're going to have to do that work in order to make this whole process work. Okay. Where are we at? You just did, I'll double check that six and four acres. Okay. We're just concerned about his son right now. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to incite him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, where incite him. Where, not where would these two farmers get together with a Macintosh computer behind them? We're not farmers. Oh, what We're Carol you? and Gary. Oh, you're Carol and Gary. Yeah. Oh, okay. We're we pretending to be anybody but ourselves. She's a yuppie. <laughs>